Uh, uh, so this talk is about, um, um, as the title indicates, uh, decades of urban soil research that Ian and I have been involved in. And I would like to say a couple of things. First, of course, there are a lot of people that we thought about mentioning, but it's it's really a lot of people over over this long time who uh, participated, collaborated with us. So we will mention them here and there as we go along. This is one. The other one, uh, we are not the only two people doing soil research or having done soil research um, in Baltimore as part of the Baltimore Ecosystem Study. So for instance, Peter is in here. And so we are going to focus those projects mostly that we were very heavily involved in and not uh, mention the, the things like the, the greenhouse, long-term greenhouse gas emissions from uh, permanent plots and so on. Okay, and so um, we hope that, you know, this, this logo is also just an indication that we were working with many organizations, many people over the years. And so we, the other thing I want to mention is that because we work so closely together, it's not going to be one of us, you know, 20 minutes and the other, we're going to be going back and forth uh, depending on, on the topic. So Ian's going to start. So this is a slide. This I want to introduce uh, the sassafras soil, which is our Maryland state soil, mostly found on the eastern shore. Um, and it is an example of soil being a very complex biomaterial, right? And some, some of the things that we investigate when we look at soils are physical properties, chemical properties, and biologic properties. Um, examples of physical property is the density of the soil, uh, the texture of it, like the particle size. Some of the chemical properties are nutrients and metals, and then biologic or what's living in the soil. Um, and so we, we're going to address some of those with some of the data that we have. Okay, go ahead, please. Um, ultimately, uh, to us humans, soils are important because of the ecosystem services they provide, right? And by definition, ecosystem services are benefits to humans gifted by the natural environment or soils. And this is a nice figure that explains a lot of the, the ecosystem services provided. Um, I'll just mention a few. One is carbon sequestration. Soils are very important for carbon sequestration and its effect on climate regulation through uh, photosynthesis and then uh, the material being deposited within the soil. Another one is water purification and soil contamin contaminant reduction. So as uh, waters go through the soil, they are purified and as contaminants, whether they're organic or inorganic, are, um, are basically captured and stored in the soil. So purifying the soil and the water as it goes uh, to different waterways. Uh, another is nutrient cycling, um, habitat for organisms, um, and flood regulation. Right, so a function being infiltration of water into the soil, but the ecosystem services is flood regulation. Okay, next slide, Kathy. And before you go in, I just want to mention, this is an original Yassilonis art piece, because Ian is a very talented uh, uh, artist, so, um, and it already indicates all these variation that we see in an urban soil system. Go ahead, Ian. Thank you, Kathy. Yep, this is a, a, a drawing I put together for a paper that Kathy and I uh, uh, wrote. It was a chapter looking at biodiversity. And there's a, there's a continuum within this drawing of uh, an urban rural gradient with the far right being a sealed surface with uh, asphalt, and then the left being what we would expect to see in sort of a natural forest here in, in Maryland. This is the general outline for our talk. So we're gonna talk about what makes urban soils unique. We're gonna talk about some of the physical chemical properties, biological properties. Then we're gonna go into two multi-city uh, comparison studies that we're involved in, the temporal changes and then community engagement. But first we wanna talk about urban soils. This is a nice figure that 
looks at the socioeconomic system, right? The, the influence of humans on soil. So you have certain pressures, right? You have demographic, you have policies that affect human activities. Uh, in our case, it's urbanization, but there's a, a wide variety of human activities affecting soils. And these activities affect land use change, um, direct disturbances, which have an effect on the soil system, right? The constituents of the soil system, the structure of the soil system, and we go back to these properties of the physical, chemical, and biological. And in uh, these changes, they directly affect ecosystem services, which have a feedback loop into policies um, and so on and so on. This is a figure looking at um, Jenny's or Yenny's uh, five factors of soil formation. And they are uh, the things that create soil or are responsible for soil uh, pedogenesis are parent materials, right? So if you have a, uh, a soil formed on limestone compared to shale, you're gonna have very different soils. Climate, a soil in um, a tropic zone would be very different one than a boreal. Topography, um, the bottom slope uh, is gonna have higher concentrations of organic matter, will probably be wetter than the upper slope of a catena. Organisms such as earthworms or moles or anything what? that mixes up the, what's that? Vegetation. Vegetation. And then there's time. So Maryland has very old soils. If you were to compare them to New York, that's been recently, quote, recently uh, glaciated, which would have been about 10,000 years ago. Um, but these Oops, are sorry. all, what's that? Okay. These are all affected by humans, right? And so beneath, uh, each each one of these soil forming factors, we have the human induced changes such as physical disturbance, uh, sealing of the soil for uh, the parent materials, uh, for climate, um, the heat island effect or water management, topography is just changes in landscape, land, landscape organisms, the introduction of what we particularly study is earthworms. Um, and then time when you, when you mix up the soils and, and, and you, you basically reset the time at which that soil has been developed. Okay, next one. And in, so this is Baltimore County. So there's Baltimore City in there in Baltimore County. And even without human impacts in, in Baltimore County, there is a huge diversity of, of soils. So when we study soils in Baltimore, we're confronted with uh, the Piedmont, which is to the uh, the the west side, that sort of the purple um, in Baltimore City, which is a meta basalt, which you would find in Lincoln Park and around here. And then to the east, you have these unconsolidated materials, and just that makes uh, uh, studying soils in Baltimore very challenging. Next one. One way that we can study the effects of urbanization on soils is through an urban rural gradient. And this is just a, a, a figure of that. Um, and the idea is that if we establish an urban rural gradient on the landscape, that we can look at the effects. An urban rural gradient is where you have sites within the urban context, and then you have sites in the rural and sort of further uh, the wildlands. Um, where it's less disturbed. And in, in, in that gradient, you can look at the effects of the impervious surfaces, the built structure. You can look at the effects of changes in physical and chemical environments, uh, invasive species introduction. And at the urban end, there's a lot of habitat fragmentation. And that's something to consider when we're, when we're looking at soils and sort of their temporal and spatial variability. One thing that I have found useful, uh, and this is actually, I, th I think Rich Poyat um, and Eflin came up with this idea of uh, direct and indirect factor factors that affect soils. Um, this is a nice framework to um, come up with hypotheses and 
uh, ideas about soils and what's going on. And so on the left, you have the, the direct effects, right? So there's landscape change, there's cut and fill. So when a bulldozer goes through and just manipulates the soil, that is a direct effect. Another one is compaction and just putting sealed services over soils. I mean, that's a huge effect in terms of how the soils interact with the environment. And the bottom one there is uh, inputs, you know, fertilization or irrigation or organic matter inputs. And then we have the indirect effects and the, the, the figure there is precipitation. Um, so that has, uh, so increased precipitation can increase alleviation and inc increase uh, movement of nutrients to the soil profile. Then we have pollutants, whether it be from cars or industrial stacks that indirectly are deposited. Um, we think about acid rain, nitrate deposition, lead. Uh, and then finally species. And this is an earthworm that has a huge effect on, um, on forest ecosystems. This is a nice figure also. And so the one to the left is no direct influence of human activity. You have a nice little organic layer, then you have sort of what in this area would be like a, a bee horizon. And then as you go to the right, you can see the effects of human activity. So the one to the next right is the truncation of the top layer. So anytime a development uh, for a housing development, they just scrape off that organic matter, they level it, they get down to this clay BT horizon, and then it's much more stable for engineering. And that's where they, 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 they build their houses. Um, and it has an effect on those soils in the front lawns. Then there's mixing, uh, sort of with the bulldozer or whatever. Then there's the burying of native soils. And I've seen this next a variety of places, right? But I've seen it next to agriculture fields along the stream where you have that buried A horizon due to some sort of er eroded material. Then there's just a the mix up incorporation of man-made materials. And then there's the sealing of uh, surfaces due to roads. And this is a profile in New York City. And this is just to give you an idea of what has been found. So in the middle is a proportion, of course, fragment in their rocks, concrete, slag, bricks, coal. Um, but even fairly deep, you have uh, these particular uh, anthropogenic artifacts, the slag from burning, you have bricks, coal, concrete, shells, and glass, among many different other things. But um, I think now they're starting to classify this stuff and incorporate it into um, soil surveys. So our major questions that we have addressed over the years and continue to address are how do human activities alter soils and cities? How do they affect life below ground? And looking at soils globally, how are they similar or dissimilar? This is mine, right? Okay. Or is it yours? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so the, the throughout this talk and throughout our lives, actually heterogeneity or patchiness or dealing with a high variety of conditions, whether on the surface or below the surface, whether naturally created or human created is essentially the major challenge of studying soil. So there are a few atmospheric scientists in this um in this meeting, and I'm sure they have some pain when they have to deal with heterogeneity, but their pain is nowhere near to our pain. Uh, when we try to design an experiments, you know, just uh, find locations or or how how we replicate things and so on and so forth. So this heterogeneity starts with uh, on the surface with land use types, and there are many land use types. Um, uh, in the city. So uh, we generally just focused a few of them, uh, forest patches, parks, uh, whether it's park lawn or, or areas underneath park trees, residential areas. And then in particular in Baltimore city, we have done especially more recently work on vacant lots, improved and unimproved vacant lots. 
And so that is not even capturing um, uh, what's underneath because you can have a grass cover and underneath the soil conditions can be very, very different as we're finding this out. So now we're moving on to physical chemicals. So we'll show you some uh, data, some projects and some data starting with soy carbon. And so Ian is the carbon guy. So this is a, um, a, a photo that the National Park Service sent me of their monoliths. Um, and I think this is a, this is a great example of a human influence. And so the to the left there, you can see it's the bottom of that middle um, monolith. And you can see, I think that's a tab can in there. There's a Budweiser yes. can, it just always strikes me funny. Uh, so that's pretty deep, you know? And then in the far right one, there's a brick. And so this gives you an idea that anything above that, actually that second one there is a spur from a cowboy boot. Right here. <laughs> Whoops, sorry. So everything, everything above that has been yeah. manipulated. So even though, like Kathy was talking about, uh, land uses, so there were land cover types, whether this be all turf grass, beneath that turf grass, they're, they're very different in terms of structure and function. Okay, next slide. And so not only is this heterogeneity below ground, but it's also above ground on the surface. And this is an intensive study we did at Cub Hill, which is uh, Northeast Baltimore, just outside of Baltimore City. And it was a neighborhood um, and we were looking at uh, the forest compared to the neighborhood. So you can see, right, the top is the forest where you have uh, a certain amount of organic matter, but it, it doesn't vary that much. And in the residential area, where there is direct management, the heterogeneity is much higher. And so these concentrations of organic matter from 1.4% to 35% are huge differences. And this is only for the top five centimeters. Um, so it's just the influence of, of, of uh, management practices on the heterogeneity of soils. This was a study that uh, using data from Dave Nowak's uh, U4 plots or I-tree plots. And what Rich and I did was uh, estimated soil uh, carbon densities within these urban areas. So these are all the different states with all the different urban areas. Yeah. yeah. So we have above ground and below ground. And what we found is that there are 2.8 times greater carbon in soils uh, than above ground vegetation in the urban land in those states. And this number lines up with uh, the global number of about three times. And really, you know, NSF is excited about the idea of how do we capture carbon and deep drilling to get carbon into in, into the soil, but really, if we just focus on managing agriculture lands or, or managing carbon within our soil, I think we can have a great effect on the climate, but it's not very flashy and it's quite boring. Um, and then the other one, this is using the same data and we were looking at land uses within Baltimore City, and this is a carbon density on, on the y-axis. And basically it's showing that uh, forest land use stores the most carbon, and that's pretty obvious, right? Because trees are a huge uh, uh, source of carbon storage, and then you have the soils on top of that. But on a per unit basis, forest land is very important for storing carbon. So this was one of the ecosystem services that we mentioned at the beginning. Climate regulation is another one. and. And that the, the degree or the efficiency of that in urban land, of course, depends on how much pervious surfaces we actually have. But we do know that the soil atmosphere or soil air interface is very important in terms of regulating the local water cycle and also heat regulations. And so this is one of the data sets. So we uh, have data, long-term data and, and high head, uh, high, um, uh, well, small uh, scale variations of, of soil temperature and soil moisture. This is showing a long-term data set. It's probably 
10, 10 years or so data set from the Baltimore Ecosystem Study permanent plots. And so we always talk about uh, cities being warmer, but um, as you can see, that also translates to soil temperature, not just the air temperature. So in urban areas, um, the, the these are average, daily average temperatures uh, over the course of the year in Celsius. And you can see that obviously there's a big difference between uh, the two major land uses, forest and grass, but there's also differences between ur urban and rural um, uh, areas of the same type. And these are quite significant, two or so, two degrees maybe, something like mm -hmm. that. But also it shows the difference uh, almost four, four-ish degrees between the land uses. And so um, not only in terms of, you know, the absolute value, there are differences between urban and rural, but also, as I mentioned, the differences vary uh, depending on what you compare with what. So over the course of the year, the, the greatest difference is between um, the urban, uh, rural, the urban, uh, grass and the urban forest, and the least difference because the least variation are between the two forest types, or the same forest types between um, urban and rural. So we have been involved in um, to capture uh, sort of small scale spatial variation. We have been working as well on um, developing low cost, uh, reliable and so on and so on sensors. And so we went through many different generations. This is the latest generation four, uh, which we're putting together. These are soil temperature, soil moisture sensors. The, the, these are little, what we call modes. These are computers, data loggers, and radio transmitters at the same time. And you can hook it up with different types of sensors. And so uh, this is a previous generation. This is the radio transmitter, a battery, and so on. So we got some, uh, we collected some data again from this Cop Hill uh, uh, suburban neighborhood where you have the forested area and you have a more open area showing this is just one day um, uh, data, sort of daily average, how different they are in this particular case, almost five, day, uh, five degrees or so. This is more of a one month data showing how much hotter the grass soil is and also the deeper you go as expected. Uh, the less it fluctuates. This is forest, this is grass. This was probably a rain event here. Uh, of course, uh, soil moisture or the interaction with water is even more uh, sort of complex in urban systems. There's a lot of things that uh, because of the sealed surfaces, uh, the, the connection between the water and the soil is essentially disrupted or interrupted. So, uh, but at the same time, again, this is one major um, ecosystem service that we're looking when we're talking about greening strategies and so on, essentially reducing runoff and, um, you know, making sure that soil has, soil soaks up as much moisture as possible. So again, uh, we were comparing in this um, uh, project, we were comparing uh, the two different uh, land use types in Cockfield, again, the same sensor systems, how they react to rain events. And so this is a three months worth data from a long time ago. These are the various rain events. These lines are individual sensors here in the grass indicated by green and then a selected one by yellow in the forest. And uh, this is soy moisture, this is moist, this is not so. So it's just showing the spatial variability. They are reacting, but they are reacting to the rain event to different degrees. But there are also some places, some points which are reacting differently. So soil is extremely heterogeneous when it comes to moisture conditions. And then it also captured extreme events. So uh, 12 years ago, Hurricane Irene hit uh, Baltimore. And again, you can see 
this is normal conditions, um, the tenths of the rainfall than what was raining during Hurricane Irene. And so that there's just big differences between forest and grass, how they react to, to this extreme event. So Ian is talking about infiltration. So this was a study that we did with Baltimore Green Space uh, sites and Baltimore Green Space is a, a, a nonprofit, an NGO in Baltimore City that um, protects uh, forest patches and green spaces. And these are some of their stored forest patches that um, Tawana Phillips, who was a student of Mitch Pavo Zuckerman, went out and took. Um, the mini disc, which is unsaturated um, this one. hydraulic conductivity. And uh, there were relationships between this um, flow, this water flow in the soil with coarse fragment and with bulk density. And so, so that makes sense, uh, generally speaking. And with what they thought about um, comparing it to was historic data. So they took data from 1970 to 2013, 2007, somewhere in there, and found, oh, there, yeah, 78 to 2013, and found that 89% of the storms in that period of time was 0.6 centimeters per hour or less, and that these forest patches would have been effective at absorbing or infiltrating the rain above them um, for a majority of the, the precipitation during that, that time period. Um, it, was only, it was only the surface and it was a good start. And I think we also wanna get a little bit deeper over time, but yeah, it's just, it was a good start to see how these um, different forest patches were affected and, uh, and how they affect rain events. And then this summer, um, we decided to do it a little bit more comprehensively and uh, compare saturated flow using the Satoro, uh, the single ring, a modified um, Philip Dunn, and we compared uh, forest with uh, parks and vacant lots. And Stu Schwartz had a lot to do with um, helping us guide the research and ask the, ask the appropriate questions. Um, and we are analyzing that data now, and we hope to have it available for the BSEC meeting coming up in November. Okay, so uh, we're gonna have to speed this up again. So I'll start speaking faster here. <laughs> So uh, we went through some of the biotic things. So now we'll talk about, obviously in urban areas, people are concerned about metals, especially heavy metals. And when uh, due to uh, various uh, past industrial activities uh, and the legacy of uh, various practices, lead-based paint, uh, lead in cars and so on. So a lot of these metal work uh, or heavy metal or these kinds of interest takes us to uh, vacant lots, which is a huge problem. Uh, most people are aware of this problem um, that uh, there are so many vacant lots and vacant lots essentially are places where these row homes stood at some point, they were de demolished and then they were somehow, so to speak, restored. And those soils are interesting in some way because they are, you know, partially engineered soils. So they fill up with something, the, the basement of where the home used to be, and then they do some, uh, they bring in some material and then do some landscaping, which essentially mean a grass seed. So we have done uh, work uh, during COVID in two general areas, Northeast Baltimore and then, uh, sorry, Northwest Baltimore and then East Baltimore and sampled these projects, looked at the conditions, not just uh, metals, but that's what I'm gonna talk about. Um, essentially, uh, what we found is this huge variety of surface conditions in terms of vegetation and how it's being maintained and so on, and even a bigger variety below ground. So you can just see these are surface zero to 10 centimeters soil cores from one lot 
front, back, and the middle of the lot, and we see all these various uh, conditions uh, from the brick and other materials that we mentioned before. So we analyze these soils with a, for a slew of heavy metals, and I'm just going to show lead. So essentially, uh, this map showing northeast, uh, northwest, I keep saying northeast, and, and east Baltimore, and we used a certain um, three-tier system to define, you know, the conditions. And so the the when you see this orange or something like that color, those are really uh, high values, really high concentration for lead. But even the yellows, which most of these points are, are of concern when it comes to uh, turning it into a, a garden or letting kids play in the in these areas because they can get exposed um, to these heavy metals. Most of the other heavy metals were generally on the green bar for lead. We could definitely see certain hotspots there. And so if you zoom in a certain lot, and this is my front lawn, and uh, I'm, I'm not living, I'm living in a, a very obscure neighborhood. And so even in this neighborhood, you can see as expected that close to the building, there is this legacy of, you know, decades, or in my case, 100 years of lead paint or decades, let's say, of lead paint, because very close to the house, these are huge, really, really high, uh, values actually from up to from here all the way, these are a big concern uh, when it comes to uh, lead uh, concentration. So we're going and, to city scale. Go ahead, Ian. And at the city scale, these were plots that were um, taken from Dave Nowak's uh, U4. So we sampled about 126 plots throughout Baltimore City. And this is a creaked map of lead uh, that we found in the top 10 centimeters throughout Baltimore City. And you can see in the center is the highest value, uh, sort of that, that butterfly that we see uh, a lot in Baltimore. And it looks like it's very highly correlated to Baltimore vacant lots. Um, so it's a very similar pattern. And when we, when we look at lead, copper, um, and zinc together, we also see a very similar um, shape or form spatial distribution within Baltimore City. And a lot of that comes from um, cars. So copper from brake linings, lead from the tailpipe, the exhaust and zinc from tires. So uh, given those main roads in those areas, there was a relationship between copper, lead and zinc and roads statistically. Oops. And this is looking at lead at different scales. So we have the scale of watershed 263, which is a uh, um, uh, an area in Baltimore City that is defined by its watershed, its sewer shed. Uh, then we have Baltimore at a much larger scale, and then Cub Hill, which was the the, the neighborhood scale. And what we're looking at are the number, the frequency is the number of plots that, so there are different number of plots that were found at different concentrations of lead. And so the blue being Baltimore um, had, and there's two lines in there. There's the EPA line at 400, and then there's the Netherlands line at 80, 80 parts per million. And so you can see that for Baltimore, 50% of the plots are greater than the Netherlands value of 80, right? And for Watershed 263, it's 75% of those plots are greater than the Netherlands. And for the EPA, 10% um, in Baltimore were higher than 400 and Watershed 263, which is in the city, is 16%. So there is, um, there is certainly an effect of urbanization on, on lead concentrations that we're finding in the soil. Well, it also shows that depending on where we draw these lines, you know, people, uh, so it's, it's somewhat confusing <clears throat> to say something, how safe the soil is because different states or different countries or different organizations draw these lines at different uh, places. 
Okay, yeah. so very briefly, because this is really not very closely related to VSEC, but uh, we do have to talk just a little bit about um, the biota, the living things in the soils, because people tend to forget about it, especially in urban areas, people think soils are dead, nothing lives in there, and that is not true. And so uh, they do many different kinds of things. And so we talk constantly about this diversity at many different scale, all the three dimensions. This happens to be more like neighborhood scale or land, different land uses again. We have forests and the parks and the vacant lot. And so our questions uh, regarding soil communities, whether or not um, these diversity of soil types and conditions uh, are reflected also in diversity of soil fauna. And I'm just gonna show you one example of that showing that in this particular case, the answer is yes, these are tiny little, these are mites, these little cute things are called springtails, they're very cute. And so we conducted a study looking at uh, more grassy open areas, turf and so on, and then remnant and reference forests. And these two not overlapping elliptical things just means that the fauna, the species composition is very different between the two. So uh, I can talk, I can give us whole hour talk about just earthworms, but I just want to mention here, this is a major concern. Earthworms are keystone groups. We think that they are good. Uh, they are everywhere. But most of the earthworms, and most people are not aware of them, uh, most of the earthworms here, all of the earthworms, probably at Penn State University, are non-native earthworms. Uh, they were brought from somewhere many hundreds of years ago from Europe. And then more recently, since the turn of the 20th century from Asia, these are two different groups, have different ecological effects. Nonetheless, their effects are enormous. They change a lot of things. If you compare these two soil profiles, this with invasive earthworm, this is without the understory from the understory, the horizonation, the soil, the biodiversity of these cute little things I just showed you, the biogeochemical um, fluxes, uh, a lot of things change when earthworms invade these areas. And I'm just showing one figure from our study from Baltimore, looking at how more earthworms uh, presence lead to more compacted soils that, but again, this is sort of uh, 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 contrary to what we would expect earthworm to do in our soils. So um, the um, uh, we're going to show you just two slides. So one of our major questions was, okay, so what the things that we see here in Baltimore, are we seeing in other places? And so there are two, these international collaborations that we were involved in. This one um, essentially wanted to uh, develop simple protocols to look at decomposition, microbial community composition, uh, soil conditions, you know, measure many different things. And so we conducted using the same protocol, we conducted a study in these cities and um, essentially looking at uh, four different sort of land use types, but also soil type. So not just looking at above, but also looking at below ground um, conditions, how disturbed those soils were. And I just cannot really, uh, emphasize enough how site selection is important when it comes to study anything in urban environments. So this was one. And the other one is a sort of, we're just analyzing those data. That one focused on urban parks and specifically on park trees in four climatic zones, boreal in Finland, temperate in Baltimore, and tropical in Singapore. And what we were looking at, whether or not different types of trees in old and young parts um, affect the soil conditions underneath them throughout their leaf litter and the interaction with microorganisms. Okay, so go ahead, Ian. So this was a study done in vacant lots, Kathy did. Um, and basically what it shows is that 
uh, things can change very quickly in relation to earthworms. So this is a two year period. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, the density and species richness in, in, was significantly different, increased over a short period of time. Um, and we also, so we did work uh, 20 years ago um, sampling an urban rural gradient, and we went back 20 years later and um, we looked at soil characteristics and found that over 20 years that the pH of the soil had increased statistically uh, significance, which uh, may have implications for seed germination or, or what can grow there successfully or if it stresses plants out. This was only done in the top 10 centimeters so we don't know the effect much deeper than that, but uh, to see that change over time, mainly due, so these were just in forest patches, mainly due to indirect effects was something that was surprising to us. This is going back to the, the Cub Hill study, and uh, we studied two different neighborhoods. One was in 1970, it was developed in 1970 and the other in 1980. And what we're showing here is that um, nutrients and management has an effect on soils in the sense that there is an accumulation of, in this case, phosphorus in the older neighborhood compared to the younger neighborhood. So just a 10 year difference, you can see the effect of management on these soils. And phosphorus, once it gets into the soil, doesn't move quickly like maybe calcium or nitrogen would. Um, so there is a significant buildup uh, over time. Um, okay, and so we have four more slides, very quickly going through some examples of community engagement, because people are connected to the soil, they are interested to some extent <laughs> of, of the soil conditions. And so there are various ways of, of maybe engaging the community. This is one of them. This is a study we did last year, essentially launched a citizen science project in which we got schools and interested citizens, we reach them through various social media and the master's gardener program and so on. And so what they do, they use, we give them sampling kits, they use our protocol and send us earthworms or take a picture, but send us earthworms. And um, this way we get, uh, we can increase uh, our data set in terms of what they find where. This one is how maybe we can incorporate some of our uh, projects. So this is BSEC related. Uh, this is my soil ecology class this year. And what we do, we actually go to Oliver Community Farm. This is one of the uh, improved, um, uh, actually a block of vacant lots that is maintained or taken care of by an NGO, the Sixth Branch as a veteran organization. And what we do here, we are taking soil samples and analyzing them in different parts of this big block. The things that they improve underneath fruit trees, the greenhouses, the bare soil, the vacant lot and so on collect some data and we're giving them those data that hopefully they can use infiltration and so on. They can use when they apply for grant, grants as well. And Ian. And this is uh, the efforts of Baltimore Green Space and Katie Lauters right there in the middle. Um, this is Fairwood Forest. And this was a community day where people came out and interacted with their forest. Um, and there are a couple stewards there that are represented in the photo. Um, go to the next slide. And so this, this partnership of Baltimore Green Space with a variety of other organizations um, has led to changes in policy. So in Baltimore City, um, you could disturb a forest patch and not really, there, there was very little consequences. And so what they did is through the Forest Conservation Act, they had reduced the amount of space needed to trigger 
that act. So basically it helped prevent tree loss, right? So it went from a certain number, I can't remember if it was 20,000 down to 5,000 square feet. So that's a much smaller uh, patch that if you're going to disrupt that or clear it, that you have to you have to deal with the Forest Conservation Act, and this was headed up mainly by um, Katie Lalter and uh, Miriam Avens, but it was also with collaboration with the Forest Service, with Matt Baker and UMBC, Charlie Davis and the Nat uh, Natural History Society of, of Maryland, Hopkins, Kathy. Uh, local colleges uh, like Loyola would go out there. The rugby team would go out and and pull vines. Uh, community members, the, the stewards of the forest patches that actually take care of them and maintain them on uh, a yearly basis or, or, or daily basis, really. Um, and then city and local partners. So this was uh, a, a, a true partnership that led to policy change is the title. Indicate. Yeah, and it also uh, produced uh, this uh, protocol, sets of protocol of how mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. assess the forest health, mm -hmm. and that includes, that has a, a fair amount of soil component as well. Okay, this is our last slide, so thank you for listening. And uh, I don't know how what happens now, uh, Mac. Uh, so we've got a couple minutes for questions. Um... And I've got one in the chat from Samia asking about, um, has anyone studied the sewer shed all along the Baltimore City rivers, specifically along the Jones Falls? I, I would say that uh, Peter can answer this question <laughs> better than I, in terms of, or maybe Ian, Ian you go ahead. Yeah, I, 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 so I know they have gauging stations or they did have gauging stations in Jones Falls, but in terms of actually studying the source shed as intensively as we did with Watershed 263, I am unaware of anything. Um, m most of our work uh, falls within the Gwens Falls watershed. Well, thank you for that. Um, and thank you for a very, very informative presentation. This is Samia. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to also know, you know, there in North, you've studied the Northwest Baltimore in Park Heights area. Have you compared the, um, the sewer shed in that area before and after the urban farms that have come up in the last uh, less than a decade? That would have been great to do. <laughs> That would have been great to do. Um, it, it, well, so uh, some, some of our research, I think even like in Basement Run, right? Isn't there more development since we started gauging that, uh, since USGS started gauging that, uh, that watershed? Um, but to answer your question specifically, no, we, we have not done that. We have not collected baseline data in order to make those observations. Thank you. Uh, Jason, you can go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I, I really enjoyed the talk. I love uh, soils, even though I am in the atmospheric science at this point. Um, question about lead concentrations. Um, has there been, I'm sure there has been, but I would like to know a little more because I'm always interested in this, phytoremediation strategies to remove lead contaminants. And are these effective in these certain areas? And has somebody kind of looked at that, what that would look like, and if it is an effective mitigation strategy? They really haven't found a super, a super accumulator of lead. That's what, yeah, okay. okay. So that's, that's still sort of the holy grail. Um, there are some... I believe mustards or brassias that can that can uptake lead, but not to the degree that they need to really fight or remediate a particular vacant lot that's high in lead concentrations. Um, I mean, part of the issue is that different forms of lead are plant available forms that the plants can take up, and there are all these you know particles that are not or they're bonded very strongly, so they're not available for for plant uptake. Uh, the 
a graduate student of Megan's. Uh, she and, and I and, and Eric, Eric E, we just uh, submitted a paper about looking at weeds, whether weeds, uh, in particular case, Plantago, that's specifically um, known to be a hyperaccumulator, accumulated lead in Baltimore. So he took various, using Ian's lead map, took plants from different places and look, we looked at tissues and we looked at roots and then also the soil organisms underneath them and they were not found to be uh, 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 hyperaccumulators. So that's interesting. Thank yeah. you guys. Yeah. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, I put a, a recent review paper about phyto phytoremediation of lead in the in the chat and it it, it doesn't work and it's an idea that dies very slowly. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, you, you can basically the point of this paper is it doesn't work. Stop asking about this, but it, it's, it, it's such an appealing idea. Um, I just want to ask uh, the citizen science work with earthworms is 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 great. I, I wanted to do that for years. I've had a lot of do people still think that earthworms are good and do they look at you like you're crazy when you tell them that they're a problem? Yes, they do. Uh, it depends on whom you talk to. If I gave talks to the Maryland Native Plant Society and Native Plant Society is everything about native plants and pull out the invasive. So for them, it isn't. And so they ask me, oh, how can we get rid of them? And I have to say, you can. So uh, just let's just deal with it. But yeah, a lot of people are, are surprised. And, and whether they, you know, we like them in our gardens and I tell them it's okay, at least the Europeans ones, the, the jumping worms, the Asian jumping worms are a big concern, no matter what you do or where you look at it. The European ones, they, they have a green card. They have been here for hundreds of years and we cannot get rid of them. So it's a different question in an urban setting or even an agricultural fields where they are present as well than, you know, going some uh, pristine, more or less pristine wildland area where they are invading into the forest. Yeah, it's an enduring challenge. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just glad you're, you know, doing a community science yeah. program. They are interested. I mean, the people are, have a lot of interest in it for sure. And in fact, a lot of it is a, a bottom up. It's the master, the gardening club and the master gardeners who bring the, up these questions very often. What are those jumping things in my compost or in my, you know, mulch and things like that? Great talk. I got to go to another. Okay. Thing. Yep. We are at 11. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. For a great talk. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.